Okay, so let's start. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Sergio Campos, who is going to present uh, a tutorial on model checking. Uh, Sergio has received the bachelor's degree in computer science from the Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, Brazil, in 1986, the master's degree in computer science from the same university, 1990, and the PhD degree in computer science from the Carnegie Mellon University in 1996 on the topic of formal verification of real-time systems under the supervision of Edmund Clark. Sergio is currently a full professor at the computer science department of Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. And uh, while at this university, Sergio has worked on various topics uh, such as formal verification of hardware and software, the design and implementation of multimedia systems and operating uh, system design. His interests include design, analysis, and verification of real-time systems, hardware, and software in general. Sergio, thank you very much for joining us and giving this tutorial. Well, thank you for introduction and thank you for all for coming. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Okay, uh, all right. So I will be talking about model checking and uh, this talk is composed by ideas and material from me, from Edmund Clark and Ken McMillan, which was one of Ed Clark's students. And this is an introductory, an idea about how model checking works. Let's see if it's gonna be interesting. So what are we going to talk about? So first is motivation. Why, why is it important? Why should we care? We're talking a little bit about formal methods, temporal logic model checking and CTL and some of the model checking engines that exist. We'll talk about some of them, there are lots of them. So why, why do we need automatic verification? Why do we need formal methods? Well, the reason is that if, if you imagine the implementation of a complex system, say you have a hardware with 100,000 gates or perhaps 100 concurrent modules, or a complex software system such as a flight control system has dozens of concurrent processes in multiple CPUs. So that's a very difficult system to implement, right? But other tests, suppose the system fails approximately once every three days. So this is not your average, uh, um, you know, coursework uh, practical implementation because that has to work only in, the, in front of the teacher when he checks it. Right now you're running it, it fails once every three days. And the problem is that failures are not repeatable. They depend on race conditions. Internal signals are hard to watch. So you, it fails, you try to run it again, it doesn't fail anymore. There's too much data to involved and you don't know how to handle that. There's, there are highs and bugs. So there are bugs that move when you try to pinpoint where they are. The reason, however, could be that say event X and Y happen simultaneously every 10 to the 10th times, which is approximately once every three days. You assumed mutual exclusion, but because of a bug in the system, you know, it happens. How, so how do you actually check for that? I mean, you need to check for that because you can't really reboot your system every three days. So how, how let's be more, a bit more concrete. Let's see, let's have a trivial example of how things can happen. So you have a process A, suppose the process A increments this variable, a process B decrements this variable X, and you know, it could happen at the same time. Uh, this is obviously a very simple example. And these errors can be prevented by good practice, semaphores, monitors, et cetera, et cetera. And that should prevent you from doing that, except that it doesn't. And th these errors actually, they show up in a very subtle ways. So consider this hypothetical air traffic control system and you actually have three processes. You have a reporter process, an analyzer process, and a sensor process. Process. So the sensor gets data directly from the radar and puts it into a shared memory for the other processes to access. It's the most important uh, process because you know it has to get the data from the radar continuously. The reporter is the last, the least important process because it uh, actually just shows the the. 
uh, the data on the screens, which is, you know, I forgot to translate screens, it's written in Portuguese, tell us. Uh, so the reporter gets the data from the shared memory, puts it on the screen. Not so important because, you know, if there's a problem, it just it might just sound a ring or something. So showing it on the screen is less important. And suppose that you have the analyzer. The analyzer is a, is a, a, a middle importance. For example, the sensor could detect if two airplanes are on a, on a collision course with one another. It would just ring an alarm. The analyzer might just check to see if an airplane is on the right route. So it has to access the database to find out where this route is. So it takes longer to execute, but it's not as important. I mean, if you're in the wrong route and, and notice, well, get into the right route, it can take some time to, uh, to reach the plane. So we have the sensor most important, the analyzer halfway through, and the reporter less important. Well, uh, one error is that the sensor may be blocked. It should never be blocked because it's higher importance, but it can be blocked. And this, this uh, uh, event is called priority inversion. So suppose that at time zero, the reporter executes. It's executing. It's reading data from the shared memory to put it on the screen. And then it does a lock. So this lock assumes mutual exclusion with the sensor. So this is where, it, when it's going to actually retrieve the shared data from the memory, it's retrieving that, it's locked. And then the sensor decides to run. It's time for the sensor to run. It blocks the reporter, which is correct because the sensor has higher priority. And it executes happily until it does a lock. I mean, it acquired data from the sensors, uh, from the radar, and uh, wants to put that into the shared memory, but it cannot because the reporter has locked the, the, that area of memory. So the sensor is blocked. And this is correct. It cannot proceed. So the reporter executes. At this point, the reporter is blocking the sensor. It's the priority inversion problem. However, this is what we call a bounded priority inversion problem because it lasts only as long as the maximum length of the, of the critical section in which the memory is written or read from the, uh, from the shared memory. So once the reporter does an unlock, the sensor proceeds and no problem is uh, uh, is serious because you can just take into account that the sensor may be blocked once. However, the analyzer may decide to run at some point. So suppose that in, in the time that the, the reporter is blocking the sensor, the, re, the analyzer decides to run. It can run at any time. It is higher priority than the reporter. So it blocks the reporter. However, unboundedly, this is an unbounded priority inversion. And in that case, the sensor will be blocked for an unacceptable, potentially unacceptable amount of time. So this is a serious problem and it can cause serious, uh, has serious consequences. Uh, and it's really not a simple thing to identify. In fact, I joke that it, this is a problem, is another world problem. It happened in Mars. And the NASA Pathfinder robot in 1997 just died uh, when that was a priority version problem. Uh, and that's, you know, you know, I always joke with my students, it's like I didn't want to be the guy who had to go up there and press the reset button. Uh, fortunately, NASA has experience with these things and they are able to press the reset button remotely. But you can see that this is a, a complicated problem and it's a problem that's not easy to see uh, beforehand. Oh, here's another interesting one. This is the, the Pentium FDIP bug. Uh, so the Pentium was released in 1995 and it had this interesting bug that it, it calculated the division incorrectly for a very small subset of operands. Uh, and the reason is more or less this, is it's a very complicated circuit. So I'll give just a very brief explanation. So you put the, the dividend here and the divisor here and uh, they are both compared. This algorithm that works in the way, same way that we do. I mean, we get digit by digit and we divide one by the other and get the, the result in the remainder. And it does the same thing, except that this works with two bits, right? So it gets two bits from here and here and does the math. Uh, but it, it can do the math for two bits, but it has to do it for all 64 bits. However, doing it for 64 bits takes a long time. 
So it does for eight bits, takes shorter time. And it uses this result to prepare the next calculation while the 64 bit version is coming along. However, if you do it for eight bits only, you may incur an error, but it's a known error. You can, you know, uh, which uh, uh, patterns of the operands cause an error, and this can be fixed. This is fixed by this quotient logic. So once you've done the 8-bit and decided what you're going to do in the next cycle, you use the quotient logic, which decides to multiply by one or two or change the sign of the operand for the next cycle, and that fixes the problem. So this, it, it has two adders, a 64-bit and an 8-bit one. The 8-bit one goes faster and prepares the next cycle, which might incur an error, which is fixed by the quotient logic. And the problem was the quotient logic. The quotient logic was a three bit by seven bit matrix. It was a, a, a sparse matrix. So it was compressed to remove unreachable entries. However, there were five entries that were removed that were reachable. And these five entries uh, caused problems when the operands actually matched the patterns that evolved these five entries. So this was a nightmare of a problem because it worked very well in most of the cases. And when it did not work, it only worked incorrectly when you were using an, an incredibly precise operation. It gave the error on the 10th or 11th digit of the result. So for most people, this was not a problem, but for some people, it was a problem. So it is rare, but it sure happens. It cost Intel $500 million to fix that for, because of five transistors that were removed, right? It's, it seems that this, I would guess that this was, the, each transistor of those was more expensive than the original transistors invented in the 50s. Um, so yeah, big problem, $500 million. But some of you may be thinking, oh, they deserve it, this, you know, capitalists pigs that, you know, take people, take money from the people. I am communist. I, I like the people and I don't like money. So good for them. Well, this case is perhaps more of interest then. Uh, between 1985 and 86, the Therac 25 radiotherapy machine caused a massive overdose in six patients, caused, caused two deaths immediately and worse the other patients so much that they died uh, shortly after. Uh, and the reason was that this machine had two modes of operation, an electron mode and an X-ray mode. The electron mode was very high radiation and the X-ray mode was low radiation, which was used more often, uh, but it only had one uh, emitter, which was of course high radiation. So when you wanted to use X-ray mode, you put in a filter that blocked the radiation and just let through a small amount of radiation. In these machines, however, after entering patient's data, it's possible to edit this data. In all machines, you should be able to do that. Uh, but in some cases, this caused a change in the mode of operation from X-ray to electron mode. So this was caused by an absurd error in which there was a critical section and a lock and unlock, and there was a go-to inside the critical section. And it was a you know, silly error that caused you know, a lot of problems. Uh, so the error was caused by race conditions accessing shared variables. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this was further made complicated because there was no harder interlock. A harder interlock is a pin that holds the filter in place. So it's, you know, the small dot that could be put there just to prevent the filter from getting out of the place in the wrong, in the wrong time. Now, interesting enough, the previous machine had a harder interlock but it was removed from the Theory Act 25 because they thought it was not necessary. Let's save a couple bucks. They used the same software. They considered that the software was correct. They did not know that the hardware interlock had been used quite often or in some cases. So this is another problem that uh, was very difficult to find and it caused this, this machine to have to be stopped using it. Another interesting case, uh, in June 4th, 1996, the Ariane 5 rocket was launched for its first flight test. This was the European uh, uh, Space Agency. And uh, 30 seconds after the launch, it veered off its trajectory and was self-destructed. So uh, 
this is this is the Ariane five. This is no small rocket. Uh, it it what happened was the software was reused from the previous rocket, but the, this is a, a bit of a speculation in in my part, but it makes sense from what I've read. Uh, the previous rocket was less powerful. And the way that these rockets work is they go up and that uh, they, they change positions continuously because of wind or something. And so once, once it does this, there is a, 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 a rocket that corrects. So it, it keeps correcting its trajectory. Now, if it seems that the navigation software detected a much stronger change in the course because the rocket was much uh, larger than the previous one. And the difference in the numbers were, was much larger and was fed into the software and it overflowed, the software overflow. So it, it, it was starting to tilt so much that it would fall into a populated area and it was exploded in the air. Uh, and it's one of the most expensive bugs in history. It cost $7 billion of development. So that's, you know, no small amount, but more important than that, it, it, it cost 10 years in development. So 10 years were thrown away in $7 billion because of an error that could have been prevented. So what can be done? Um, there are really important complex things happening and we should be able to have a solution for that. Simulation and testing are problematic because when you simulate or test things, you don't check for all of the possibilities. So let's consider a mathematical approach. This mathematical approach requires a model of the system as a mathematical object. So you have a mathematical object that represents formally, for example, the program state and the transition relation. Program state is everything that can, uh, uh, every value for every variable in your system, every state that your system can be in. And the transition relation tells you everything that can happen, a movement from one to the other. You need a specification method for expressing properties such as a request is always followed by an acknowledgement. So you have to be able to express the properties you want to verify. And you need a proof method to show that this model actually satisfies these properties. This proofing can be done by hand. It can be done in a semi-automatic way where the user suggests a proof in machine checked. It's very useful, but semi-automatic. It requires not only more time, but requires also that the user understands the method or the fully automatic method in which you press enter and you hope for a, for a result. Let's go for that. Well, that's a nice idea, but there are objections to that. So the first objection is that proofs are, not, are about models, not systems. I mean, I don't prove that the rocket's not gonna explode. I prove that a model of the rocket is not gonna explode. There is a difference. The specifications are subject to error and incompleteness. So my favorite example is uh, the, a specification that is, what's the answer to the big question about life, the universe and everything? We all know the answer, the answer is 42. But then your specification did not say what you wanted it to say. It, it just allowed you for an answer that doesn't help you. And it happens very often. The software that generates proofs can be buggy. So how do you know that the software is correct? And besides, computer proofs are completely unreadable. You can't check them, right? Well, this, these are all objections that, that are correct. But let's put aside mathematical certainty as our first goal, right? Let's use formal methods as a methodology that helps produce more reliable systems, right? Even if you show an error in a model, and this model has been constructed correctly, this reflects in a, in, a, in a similar error in the system and you can fix that and there will be less errors in your system. Even hand proofs are likely to produce better programs as we know and increased automation makes them even better. So our objective is to find bugs and remove bugs and uh, you know, in a more complete way than previous methods. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is that Real systems are several orders of magnitude larger than what can be handled. So imagine a simple program that with 10 integer variables in a 32-bit processor. So if you have 10 integer variables, you have 320 Boolean variables. Well, that's 10 to the 96 configurations. You have possibly 10 to the 96 configurations 
of all the values of these variables. Just for comparison, 10 to the 80 is the number of atoms in the universe. So that's a very, 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 very large number of configurations. So that's the problem. That's why uh, formal methods, you know, everyone starts talking by, well, you know, how large can you do it? Or it's not very uh, efficient. Well, it is very efficient. It's just that the problem that we're trying to solve is incredibly hard. And the question is, can we do non-trivial things? Can we go from the toy examples to real examples? Yes, we can. Automation, fully automated methods help because they allow you to explore uh, combinations more efficiently. There is efficiency in the representations. For example, with BDDs, we've gone from 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 20th states overnight. So you, you just change the representation. It's way more efficient. BDDs are not at the, at the front edge of research anymore. And so you know, 10 to the 20th, which was a big number at, uh, you know, back in the day, is considered a small number today. Compositional reasoning. We can divide the system into simpler subsystems, verify them, and combine them. We heard about that yesterday uh, uh, with Orna's talk a little bit. So yes, we can do non-trivial things. And the idea here is model checking. Model checking is then a technique that relies on building a finite model of a system and checking if a desired property holds in that model. So that's what we're gonna do. We build a, a model and verify it using an exhaustive state space search. We will look for all of the states, however large the number may be. The challenge, of course, is to devise algorithms and data structures that can handle very large models, right? Temporal logic model checking uh, is the approach we're going to explain here. It was developed independently by Clark and Anderson and by Kail and Sifakis in the early 80s. Uh, in this approach, specifications are expressed in temporal logic and the, the systems are modeled as finite state transition graphs. And uh, there is an algorithm that just checks if the specification is satisfied in that uh, model. The term model checking was coined by Clark and Emerson. And this work has been awarded the 2007 ACM Turing Award to Clark, Emerson, and Sifakis. The model of computation is this. Suppose that you have this model, this graph, and the initial state is a state where A is true, B is true, and C is false. And then you can move to a state where A and B are false and C is true and stay there. Or you can go to a state where A is false, B is true and C is true. And you can look back and forth to go to the state, right? So the picture I have in my mind is if you hold this graph by this state and then you just shake it like that, it will unroll and you get the computation tree, A, B, C, 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 A, B, C, 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 A, B, B, C, C. A, B, B, C, C, and all of the possible paths are in this computation tree, which is of course infinite and which we're not gonna build, but we use it for reasoning about uh, the properties we want to verify. And to reason about those, we will use CTL, computation tree logic. CTL is a logic for reasoning about properties of these state transition graphs. It can, express many of interesting properties that are uh, used for verification. CTL operators, they have two parts. They have a path quantifier and a state quantifier. The path quantifier is an A or E. For every path, there exists a path. And a state quantifier is an F, G, X, or U. It's F, P in the future, something P holds. G is globally. P holds, X is holds in the next time, and P and 2Q means that P holds and 2Q holds. When you combine those, you got an AF for every path in the future it holds, and AG for every path it holds globally, and so on and so forth, with this interesting picture that I like to show. So suppose, oh, here's are some typical interesting uh, CTL formulas. EF started and not ready. So there exists a path where in the future you started there are not ready. This means that it's possible to get to a state where started holds, but ready does not hold. So this would be an error. So EF is like this. There is one path that leads to, to the state. This means that G, EFG means that G is reachable. It's possible to reach that state. Uh, AG 
it means that, okay, let's go in order. So EG is reachable. AF means that for all paths in the future, G will hold. So this means that G <coughs> is unavoidable. You will reach G no matter what happens. Doesn't matter what path you take, you will reach G. EG has the least intuitive explanation. It's potentially invariant. There is a path in which G will hold forever. And the AG is for all paths, it's globally true G. So AG means it's an invariant, right? So look at this formula, AG something. This means that the something is an invariant. It's always true. What is the something? Request implies AF acknowledgement. So request implies that always in the future an acknowledgement will hold. So this means that if there is a request, it doesn't matter which path you take, you will get an acknowledgement. Right, so uh, it, it, this, this uh, uh, formula expresses the property that all requests are acknowledged, no matter where, and they will be acknowledged. Other properties, AGAF, device enabled. It's an invariant to the system that it's always in the future device will be enabled. This means that you don't, the device will not die, will not be disabled and stay disabled forever because there is always a path that will lead to device enabled or AGEF restart. It's an invariant of the system. Doesn't matter where you are, it is possible to restart the system. So you can see the CTL formulas are rather useful. They actually express a lot of interesting things about the temporal aspects of your system, the order in which events happen in your system. So now we have our specification method, and we'll use uh, a creep key structure, which is a state transition graph, which is a triple uh, with a, S as a set of states, R is a relation, transition relation, some mapping of state to state tells you from which state, which other you can reach, and a labeling function that gives the set of atomic propositions to in that state. I'll give you an example. Uh, and let M be a one state transition graph, one creep key structure, let F be a formula. And so find all states S such that in M, S satisfies F. That's the model checking graph. Well, here's an example of how it works. And it does not work the way you'd think it would unless you know how it works. So suppose that I want to find out the set of states that satisfy EFP. What does EFP mean? Well, EFP means that P is reachable. So I want to get all the states that will eventually have a path to a state where P holds. We can see here in this graph that this does not satisfy EFP. This of course satisfies EFP and this one and this one as well. So there's a path here that satisfies EFP. How do we do that? Well, we do it the other way around. Instead of looking for paths, we look for states that do satisfy EFP. So we start with this with the P states. States that satisfy P satisfy EFP. Of course, they, 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 there is a path in the future that P holds and this future is, is right now. So we call it, we start with false and we call EX false, we get P. So P and or X or EX false, we get P is the first state. Now we iterate this transformation. Now we, instead of U0, U0 is P, we get U1. So the set of states that satisfy EFP in one path is those that satisfy P and those that have a transition to a state that satisfy P. And we go on. We find this one. So U3 is P or EX of U2 of iteration two. Now look at these numbers. The numbers change, but we don't change the set of states. It's because we found all of the states that satisfy EFP. Of course, this can be proven but it's you know, beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, and the idea here is that you start from the states that satisfy P and you move backwards, including states that lead to P in one step. And you increase the set of states that have been visited until you reach a fixed point, until you reach a, a point where you're not uh, including any more states. And that's when you stop and say, this is the set of states that satisfy EFP. This is how the algorithms work. So this is model checking, very simple. But the interesting thing comes when you start thinking about the engines that power these model checking tools. 
um, they make the model checking uh, from an academic example, an academic proposition to a real world proposition because these engines are rather very efficient. So initially you have explicit state model checking, you just implemented graphs in the way that you would do in a, in a naive way. Uh, Spin is one model checker that did that a long time ago. I'm not up to date on the spin, how spin works today, uh, but it's a very, very interesting model checker. Uh, you can have BDD-based model checkers, binary decision diagrams, model checkers. You can have SAT-based model checkers. Uh, and I'm skipping briefly over those because as you can see in red, those are the ones that I'm going to talk about. Uh, you can have SMT, satisfiability modular theory, model checkers, and the idea is that you don't represent some formula symbolically as we would with other tools. You just push it into another engine, gets a true false back, and then you use the true false in your symbolic representation. This is very, very efficient. And uh, this is obviously a very, very simplistic explanation of what it does. You can have probabilistic model checking, which you just add probabilities. You can say that a request implies that in the future an acknowledgement will hold will happen with 99% probability, for example. There are many applications in which this is very, very important. Or another interesting one, statistical model checking. This combines model checking and simulation. The, the temporal logic formulas guide the simulation. Simulations are not exhaustive and can lead to false results. So uh, you, what you do is you get a result and you simulate again and again and again a number of times until you, you, uh, you reach the, the precision you're looking for. The higher the precision, the more simulations will be needed, the longer it takes. So this is a, another very interesting example of an engine for model checking. So you can do different things with this engine. And let me just explain two of those, which will give you an idea how, how they work. I start with BDDs, binary decision diagrams. Binary decision diagrams are a canonical form for Boolean formulas, and they are often substantially more compact than traditional normal forms and can be manipulated very efficiently. So this is the, the seminal paper for BDDs, Randy Bryant, uh, 1986. He did not invent BDDs, he just uh, proved some interesting and useful properties of them in 1986. So to motivate this discussion of BDDs, let's start with BDTs, binary decision trees. So suppose <clears throat> that I want to represent this, this formula here. A1 if and only if B1 and A2 if and only if B2. This formula means that A1, A and B encoded in binary are the same. This is true when A represented in two bits is the same as B represented in two bits. So let's see, let's choose a path here from A1. A, let's say A1 is true and B1 is false. And then A2 is true and B2 is, false, is true too. And the result is false. Notice that I chose this path here. And this means that A1 is different than B1. So it's gotta be false. Notice that it is false for every subtree reached at this point. If I choose A1 true, B1 true, A2 false, and B2 false, I get out true because A2 is equal to B2 and A1 is equal to B1. So this is a binary decision tree. They do not provide a very concise representation for Boolean functions because there's usually a lot of redundancy in such trees. And let me, I'll be speaking a bit fast. There are some, things detailed in this, in this talk that are there for completeness and so you can download this later on and uh, take a look at them. But I'll skip some, otherwise I will not have the time to complete. So um, this is some redundancy. You see that everything here is false because A1 is different than B1 in these two cases, it doesn't matter the value of A, A2 and B2. So we can simplify those. In the same way, uh, if you look at these red subtrees, they are equivalent because if A1 and B1 are zero and A1 or, or A1 and B1 are one, it doesn't really matter if it's zero or one, it means that they are the same. So you're gonna just check to see if A2 is equal to B2. So these two subtrees are equivalent and we just get rid of one of them. And you can see 
that this, uh, this structure is much smaller than this structure, which is the BDT. And this is the BDD. So more precisely, you read this later on the, on the slides. In practical application, it is desirable to have a canonical representation. A canonical representation means that if you have two BDDs and they are the same, if and only if they represent the same Boolean formula, and this simplifies tasks like checking equivalence of two formulas and deciding if a given formula is satisfiable or no. And there is a simple way of making BDDs canonical. And uh, it, it, Brian showed that you can do that by just making sure that the variables appear in the same order along each path, and there are no isomorphic subtrees in the, in the diagram. To make sure that the variables appear in the same order, it's very simple. You just impose a total ordering on the variables, and you just create the variables in that order. That's easy. And uh, to ensure that there are no uh, redundant subtrees, uh, you just apply this algorithm, which I'm not going to explain in detail. You just remove duplicate terminals. So what's the duplicate terminal? If you look at this example, you got two ones and three zeros. That's wrong. You should have just one, one and one zero. Now, once you do that, you remove these duplicate terminals. It, it bubbles up, right? You can have duplicate non-terminals and redundant tests. And then you eliminate those as well, and you get to the canonical uh, um, representation for the Boolean formula, right? Uh, and this can be done uh, in uh, by a procedure called reducing linear time. So these are very very efficient, right? Uh, and so the term ordered binary decision diagram or reduced ordered binary decision diagram uh, is the representation that's results from this, and it makes checking equivalence uh, of, B, of BDDs and satisfiability very, very simple, right? Which is kind of strange because satisfiability is an NP problem. And so it seems that we've solved the P equals NP problem, which is not true because the BDDs can be very large. So if you can build a BDD, you can check it in the uh, very fast, but it's not guaranteed that you can build a BDD, right? Uh, of course, I'm skipping the details about BDDs, but let's go on and explain how we can use BDDs in model checking, what is called symbolic model checking. So suppose that you have your system and your system behavior is represented by a lot of variables V1 to Vn. So each variable represents one piece of your system and the value of all the variables represent one state of the system. There's a transition relation that tells you that from this state, you can go to this other state. And we're going to represent those using a set of um, unprimed variables, which represent the current state and a set of primed variables that represent the next state, right? And convert that to a BDD. This does not make much sense, I imagine, but it's much simpler with an example. So suppose that my program has only two variables, A and B, and I will create four variables, four BDD variables, A and B, A prime and B prime. So A and B represent the current state and A prime and B prime represent the next state. I will represent each transition as a formula. So suppose that I have a transition from A true B true to A false B true. I'll represent this by A and B and not A prime and B prime. Current state, next state. So that's very simple. Now I can represent a complete graph by representing each transition in a transition relation where the transition relation is the disjunction of all transitions. So suppose that I have this graph, not A not B leads to A not B, A not B leads to AB, you can stay there and go to sleep. So uh, the, the, the Boolean formula that represents this transition is this one. So let's start with this last one. It says not A and not B and A prime and not B prime, it represents this transition. That's very simple, right? Now these are more interesting what this says is that if B is true, B will be true in the future. It doesn't matter what A, uh, uh, what is the value of A. And this happens here. If B is true, B keeps being true. If B is true, B keeps being true. The same here and the same here. So this sub formula actually represents these four transitions. And this one says that if A is true, B will be true in the next state. So it represents this and this transition. Notice that it represents also this and this transition, 
So there is some overlapping of these transitions, but this is just a way of seeing it, right? There's a Boolean formula. There's a presentation that represents exactly the set of transitions. And now I can use that to calculate my model champion. How? Well, there's a function, a check that takes a CTL formula as a, as a parameter and returns the set of states that satisfy that formula, right? And this is interesting because uh, the CTL has the CTL operators and the standard Boolean operators, or and not, or and the not are just handled by the BDD's algorithms, which are simple. And there is one function for EX, EU, and EG. And the other ones are rewritten in terms of these operators because uh, they are equivalent in some interesting way, which I will not show, don't, don't have the time. Now, uh, you have check EX, check EU, and check EG. I will just show check EX, which is the more interesting one. So check EX is simple. I love this, check EX is simple. There's nothing simple about it. There is something very interesting and very elegant about it, but it's not simple. Well, let's see if we can understand it. So I want to find out EX of F. I want to find out the states that satisfy EX of F. So this means that I have to get all the states that satisfy F and move back one transition. Because if I move back, I will have one state that has one transition that leads to F. So EX, not EF, EX means you move back one step from F and you find that state, right? And this is the formula that computes that. So if you have an F, it's, it's the V bar means that F is represented in the current state variables. So what do I do? First is I do a shift on these variables and I represent them as the next state variables. The next state variables are the end states of the transitions that I'm interested in. I want the transitions that lead to F. So I want the transitions that have F as the next state, right? Now I do a conjunction with the transition relation. The transition relation contains all of the transitions. So if I do this, this conjunction here, I will end up, the result of this expression is the set of all transitions that lead to F. This is, these are the transitions that I want. Now I do quantify out this V prime, which means I remove the next state from these transitions and I get the current state, right? Uh, so this is the formula that does it. And uh, it, it's a bit mysterious how to do it. And let's hope that this example will uh, make it a bit clearer. And uh, let's see that I have, you know, my favorite transition relation. And I want to find out E x of A and not B. Well, let's see, oops. A and not B is the state. I want to find out the predecessor of the state, which is this one. This one has a successor in this one. It's the only one in this graph. So what do I do? I do A and B and not B prime, which is representing it at the next state. And I do a conjunction of this and the transition relation. So this is uh, not B prime. This is false. This is also false. So I get not A and not B and not A prime and not B prime, which is this part of the transition relation, which are the transitions that lead to A and not B. Now I get rid of the next state part and I get not A and not B. So from this, I go to this. Another example, E X of B, I want to find out which states have B true as the next state. So I represent it as a B prime, as the next state, and I do a conjunction. Now the conjunction, this is this and this and not this one because this is B prime and this is not B prime. So I get B and B prime and not A and B prime. So now I get read of the next state and I get A or B. So see how interesting it is. If, if in, the, in, in the state A is true or B is true, it means that B will be true in the future. A is true, B is true in the future, B is true, B is true in the future, and it works, it simply works. So with this, you are able to represent your state graph as a Boolean formula, represent it as a BDD. And you are able to get your CTL formula and manipulate this, these Boolean formulas and get a Boolean formula that represents the set of states. So this is very, very interesting and works very well. 
And this was the basis for SMV, the symbolic model verifier implemented by Ken McMillan. Uh, it allows you to represent finite states described in the SMV language, specifications given a CTL formulas and uses BDDs. The CTL language allows the description of synchronous and asynchronous systems, modularized and hierarchical descriptions. The data types are Booleans, enumerations, or integers. It allows non-determinism and a lot of different specifications in CTL. So this is an example of an SMV program. You have a variable request, which is a Boolean, and a variable state, which is an enumeration ready or busy. It's a Boolean as well that's represented internally as two options, ready or busy. And you assign an initial state is ready, and the next state is a function of the variables in the current state. If the state is ready and then there is a request, it goes to busy. Otherwise, it goes from top to bottom. If this is not true, it is a non-deterministic choice between ready and busy. So this means true. It means that in all cases, if nothing uh, beforehand was true, it will execute that, so it will be ready or busy non-deterministically. Notice that I do not assign a value to a request. A request could be true or false at any moment. And I write a spec, which is CTL. AG request implies AF state equals busy. So it's a very simple language, and it's uh, uh, easy to learn. You can do instantiations. Uh, you can do a module, module counter cell, and you instantiate that as different bits. So I have uh, in this, I have a, a, a variable value boolean and a variable carryout. So I use bit zero dot carryout is the carryout for this instance and so on and so forth. And I can create very large, sophisticated models this way. Uh, and this is an interesting one. It's a mutual exclusion example. And so I said, this is module user. So each user, it's just two users in this example. And you have a state. If it's mutual exclusion, it can be, I don't want to get into this critical section. I am trying and I am in the critical sections, M, T, and C. The initial state is non-trying. And the next state is, if you're non-trying, you can decide to try at any moment. It's a non-deterministic choice between non-trying, keep non-trying or go trying. If you're trying and the other guy is not trying, you get into critical section. The other guy is a parameter of this module, right? If you're trying and the other guy is trying, you look at the turn variable. The turn is your ID. ID is also a parameter in turn two. Then you go into the critical section. So let's see that if both are trying and it's your turn, you go into the critical section. If you're in the critical section, you get out of the critical section. Otherwise, you stay where you are. And my spec is state equals T implies AF state equals C. So if you're trying, you always get it. So this is just a module. And I have a module main in which I define the variable turn. Turn is one and two. And I instantiate these modules as user one and user two. User one has ID one, user two has ID two. Both receive turn as a variable because they have to see if it's their turn or not. And each has, can see the other one state. So user one gets the user two state and, and the other way around. And uh, the variable turn is modified by the main module. And it's, this, it's, a, a, it's just a simple way. If user one's not trying, user two is trying, it's the second guy's turn. Otherwise it's the first guy's turn. Or if it doesn't happen, turn just stays as it is. And the spec is, so the spec of the user means that if I'm trying, I will get it. And the spec of the system is it's an invariant of the system that it's not true that both are in the, in the critical section at the same time, right? Uh, and SMV works in a simple way. I, I, make, I made a, a simple property that's clearly false. Say, I assume that user one, it never gets into a critical section. And it's, it, shows, it tells me that it's false. And in the first state turn is equal to one, both user states are non-critical. Then the user state goes to critical and then goes, uh, goes to try and then goes to critical and then you get into the critical section. So showing that this property is false, the specification is false. So in this way, you actually see how the counter example works. It just shows you a list of the states that lead to the, to the error. So this is how BDD uh, model checking works. And let's go briefly over set model checking the bounded model checking problem, which is another engine 
that's uh, uh, very efficient as well. In many cases, way more efficient than BDDs. Um, and what's SAT? SAT is the problem of finding an assignment of values to a Boolean formula that satisfies the formula. So this is a trivial example. A or B and C or D, this is my favorite uh, Boolean formula. And one satisfying assignment is A true, B false, C false, D true, it just satisfies it. So that's a very simple trivial problem, but you know, it becomes less trivial when you have thousands or tens of thousands of variables in your formula. And uh, over the years, many solutions have been proposed for SAT and most of them, or lots of them, are variants of the daily Sputnum procedure, which is basically you choose one variable of all the variables, choose one variable and choose one value. I will assign false to variable 25. So you determine the implications of this assignment in, uh, in unit clauses. So for example, if you decide that A is zero and you have a clause A or B, this means that B has to be one, right? And then once you determine all the implications, you find out if there is a conflict. If there is a conflict, you undo the assignment and try another thing, Other, otherwise you continue. So let's see a very, very brief example. So I have a couple clauses here. So the formula is actually the conjunction of all these clauses. So they all have to be satisfied. A or B or E or D and so on and so forth. And I will choose in the order, in the alphabetical order, and I will choose false always first to assign variables, the values to. So suppose I start and I decide to assign A to false. So I made this gray, it's not very gray, but you can see that it's false. So the, the clause now becomes B or E or D. And this one as well, and this one as well. Fine, there are no implications. Uh, so I continue. Now I decide that B is false in the same way here and here, and there are no implications. So now I decide that C is false. Now when I decide that C is false, I have a, a unit clause F, and F then has to be true, otherwise, the formula will be unsatisfiable. So this is an implication. I decided that F is true and I, I still have no conflicts. So I go on and I decide that D is false. If D is false, not B is true, these are satisfied, no conflicts. And then I decided that E is false. Now, when I decided that E is false, I get a conflict. Oh, I get a conflict here. So because if I decide that E is false, this is okay, but this, clause is false. So now uh, the clause one has been unsatisfied and everything is kaput, everything is broken. I have to backtrack. So I decided that D was false. So I can go back and decide that D is true or I can go back and decide something else, uh, decide on another variable. There are many, many different set algorithms that decide on different things at different times and they, there are competitions of SAT solvers to see who does better in, in this or that formula. Uh, and I'm not going to go into that. So the idea is just try, see if it works. If it doesn't work, you backtrack and try something else. So let's see how that works with bounded model checking. And let's say that I will use uh, this two bit counter uh, as an example. The two bit counter, it starts with the zero, zero. It moves to zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero but I've added an erroneous transition here to show how the algorithm works. So my sta each state is represented by two variables, S1 and S0. In the initial state, uh, it's zero, zero. So the initial state is not S1 and not S0. And I have the function increment that does this, right? So it's S prime is the negation, S0 prime is the negation of S0. Uh, and S1 is the conjunction F0 and S1. And I will uh, define my transition relation as this increment and the erroneous transition. I want to have that to show how it works. Now, suppose I want to know if a counter will eventually reach one one, right? Uh, I specify this property by saying that AF one one, right? On all execution paths, there's a state where this one one holds. Uh, equivalent, I can check if there's a path that never reaches one one. So I can be expressed that by e.g. not one one. So is there a path in which uh, you never reach one one, right? It's the same thing. If I use bounded model checking, I consider paths of length k. This is the bound of bounded. 
I start with k0 and increment it until I find a witness. Let's assume here for simplicity that I, I use k equals two. So if I have k equals two, I have two transitions. And for two transitions, I have three states. I want to be sure that I find a witness for my, my property in three states. I'll call the states S0, S1, and S2. And I will formulate constraints on S0, S1, and S2 to make sure that all possible values for S0, S1, and S2, they are paths in the model and that they are a witness for my, my property. And how do I do that? Well, the first thing I do is I have to constraint S0, S1, and S2 to be a valid path. Remember that I have a real, my transition relation is a formula. So what I do is I make sure that the S0 is an initial state. And I make sure that there is a transition between S0 and S1. And there is a transition between S1 and S2. This guarantees that for all va uh, valid assignments to this formula, the first state is uh, uh, an initial state. There is a transition from the first to the second and the second to the third. Great, I can build that formula. Now I have to constrain the shape of the path depending on the formula. If a formula requires a loop to exist, I have to be sure that this path has a, a loop. In this case, my formula does require a loop because it says that one one is never rigid. So I have to be sure that S0, S1, and S2 are a loop. So to be sure that, that, that the sequence has a loop, I have to be sure that S2 has a loop to itself, a loop to S1, or loop to S0, right? So this is a formula also. I have to say that there is a transition from S2 to S2 or to S1 or to S0. And I call this LL. So there is a loop back to L. This is not a good notation, but you know, that's what it is. Now, if there is a loop, I have to be sure that my GP holds. So I have to be sure that one one holds, or in the case, not one or not one, holds in all of the states. So I have to be sure that P is valid in S0 and S1 and S2, right? I combine all of these to ensure that I construct a formula in which an, a satisfying assignment makes sure that the satisfying assignment is a model, for is a, is a valid path in that model, and that it satisfied the formula and there is a loop. So this loop could be a different loop for each of the positions that there's this or. In this case, it's uh, simple. And in this case, this formula is satisfiable because the, the, the property I want is either S0 is not one or S1 is not one, right? And it shows that, yes, here, not one, one, here, not one, one, here, not one, one, and there is a loop from here to here. So this assignment, is a valid path in the model. It satisfies the property and there is a loop. So there is a satisfying assignment uh, to this formula. And this means that there, this is a counterexample to my property. If I remove the self loop, then the formula is unsatisfiable. And it shows that there is no such formula. Uh, this formula is valid for states up to two, okay? So this is how set-based uh, model checking works in an amazingly fast speed, but gives you an idea. And, but there's more, there's much, much more. There is so many results in so little time. I'm you know, almost at the end of my time. There are hundreds, thousands of real systems verified. There are companies that, uh, uh, that live on that, on, on verifying systems using model checking. It's sold as service for these companies. And this has been used in many, many uh, areas. It started with harder circuits. It's moved on to software systems, real-time systems, aeronautic, biological systems. This list, is, it seems kind of partial because it is. This is all, some of the things that I have done. There are much more that has been done by other people. And I would like to end this with a, a sad note, actually, uh, to remember Edmund Clark. Edmund Clark was the, the, the guy who had the idea, together with Sefakis, uh, 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 a French researcher, Edmund Clark was an American researcher. Uh, he invented the, the model checking together with Sipakis and Emerson. Uh, Ed Clark had his PhD by Cornell in 76. He was a professor at Duke University, Harvard and Carnegie Mellon University. He was the Turing Award recipient in 2007. 
And he was behind most of these developments up to a certain point. He was the guy behind BDDs and SAT solvers, one of the guys behind SAT solvers. He died of COVID in December, 2020. Dismissed by all as a brilliant researcher, exceptional mentor, outstanding husband and father, and really missed. Mother checking would not exist today if not for Ed. So we're, you know, part of his legacy. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, it's really sad, isn't it? Indeed it yeah. is, yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Sergio, for this very interesting and informative uh, talk. Uh, do we, we have questions from the audience? You can send them in the chat or raise the hand and uh, we open the microphone. Uh, I don't see questions so far. So I have one. Uh, okay, question. so please, Tiago. Uh, Sergio, uh, which category would, would you include um, FDR and CSP uh, as an engine, a model checking engine? What kind of engine uh, would you classify that? I'll be honest with you, I don't know uh, these, uh, which engines they use. In fact, many, most model checkers use more than one engine. Uh, SMV does, BDDs does SAT, does statistical probabilistic model checking, all kinds of engines. So it is possible to just switch engines. And I don't know which ones are available for these, uh, these tools. Uh, okay, uh, another uh, uh, one curiosity. You said that before that you teach this course in your, uh, at the university. Uh, it's a model checking course, as I as I understood. I'm sorry. Uh, you said you said you teach this. Uh, yes, yes. Course. Yeah, yeah. At it's a uh, it's an automatic verification course, uh, but oh. it's centered on model checking. I try to deviate from one end to another end to things that are faster and less expressive to things that are slower and more expressive, but I center on model checking, yes. Uh, is it for, uh, what is the target pub public? Is it- uh, It's uh, graduate undergrad and undergraduate students. Undergrads? Yes. Uh, how do you think this, uh, it's the best way to, to teach them in terms of uh, getting some, um, practical uh, experience with, you know, doing some hands-on. What what do you usually uh, do? Oh, I do it all the way. Uh, the grade of the, the course is just the, the practical implementation, and I, I tell them that they're going to have to implement uh, a non-trivial system and verify it. And I guide them throughout the semester. I found out that just telling them that doesn't work at all because people have different ideas of what it means. So I, I, I go every, it's a semester course. So every two weeks or three weeks, we stop and say, what are you doing? What are you modeling? I'm modeling it this way, this is wrong. Or I'm modeling this way, this is a good idea. Now try this other thing. So it works well because they are being guided uh, all of the semester into uh, what to do. We've, we've gotten some really interesting uh, uh, pieces of a model that have been verified over the over the years in which I've, I've taught this. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I have uh, one question as well. Uh, so you mentioned during your presentation SPIN and SMV, uh, but which other tools uh, have you already used that implement these ideas on model checking? Uh, I have not used SPIN. Was, was SPIN was my, my counter example. So when I was uh, doing my PhD, this was 20 years ago, uh, we had symbolic SPIN was explicit. Uh, so we you know, looked at them as like, you know, this poor guys using old technology. But that, that was not true at all. They used explicit, but they implemented so many optimizations that it was very, very efficient. So it's a very interesting tool. Uh, from, so I used SMV. Uh, but I moved into interesting areas where the, the discrete nature of SMV doesn't work. 
uh, areas where you need timed automata and things. So we've used over the years Prism and UPAL as tools that allow you to represent richer models, right? It's interesting because uh, uh, you see that in many cases, the rich models are not needed. You can simplify them. They are discretized by other necessities. But in some cases, it's really needed. So you just have to use one of those tools. Currently, we are using UPAL. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting tool and it's very efficient. However, because the models are so much more complex, you cannot say the number of states. I mean, the number of states make no sense, right? In SMV, you can say 10 to the 20 states and it's rather impressive. Right in the in the UPAL, the timed automata world, you can have something with ten states that is as complex as something to the ten to the twenty states. So you you don't compare number of states anymore, uh, but you you are able to do some very very uh, large models with these tools. Currently, we're using UPAL. SMV has an, an extension also called New XMV that allows you to do this as well. Uh, UPAO is more mature then, however, so <clears throat> my students have been preferring to use it. Okay. Uh, so I would like to thank you, Sergio, again. Oops, there's something in the chat. Uh, yes, it, uh, a question has just a <coughs> reference, so maybe the last one. So there is the following question. Uh, SMC uh, supports trajectory-based checking. Uh, can we use it for checking reinforcement learning? Uh, so trajectory-based learning. Would you have any ideas, directions, suggestions regarding this? Well, I'm not sure <clears throat> what trajectory-based checking is. Uh, it, it reminds me of trajectory, symbolic trajectory evaluation. Uh, but the idea, the idea, the suggestion is statistical model checking because statistical model checking, <clears throat> it just simulates and learns from the results. So I think that uh, uh, something in the in the lines of statistical model checking would be more in the direction of this this, this uh, uh, suggestion from Tamil Sovan. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, and the other thing I suggest is check the work from the previous keynote speaker. I think that's related to that as well. Okay, so uh, thank you uh, once again. Well, uh, thank you. And I think that's time to finish uh, the tutorial. I'm afraid uh, if you have further questions, you can reach Sergio on Discord uh, and ask him uh, more questions. So Tiago, do you want to say something about